this final episode, perhaps final episode, of what we want to say about the whole Bletchley Park story, it's got a very personal touch for me because this one is triggered by that question that all sons and daughters ask of their parents, their mum or their dad, and I certainly did. I said to my dad, Dad, what did you do in the war? And I got the reply, and always did, um, codes and ciphers, son. It's absolutely top secret, still. I mean, this was in the 1950s, 60s, I was asking. Can't tell you about it, sorry. My dad was not actually at Bletchley Park, but he was what was called a cipher sergeant, and he received summarised decrypts from Bletchley Park. And it was his job, for the place he was posted, RAF station or naval station, to take the decrypts under most secure conditions to the person in charge who knew about what was called the ultra secret. You had to have full security clearance, and my dad did as well. So I'd like to tell you that story, but perhaps we ought to lead up to it a bit more chronologically and get you there in stages. We left the story last time in 1941-42. Even the four rotor naval enigma could just about be got on top of. The Army and Air Force One really from about 42 onwards was not too much trouble. So you've got these decrypts and they're all wonderful and they're giving you all of this intelligence. How on earth do you get it out into the field to the commanders that need it fast enough? If you think about it, it would come in, you know that the, uh, the, the code settings are going to be changed in another 12 hours time. You'll have to work those out. You let the, um, the techies, the boffins as they call them in, in those days, get on with that. But what about the intelligence community behind them? Hut 3 and Hut 4, I think, were two of the big intelligence huts at Bletchley Park. And their job was to take um, all of the decrypts and see what they meant, and try to synthesize them, put them all together, decide who should get what, try to make some sense out of it. Because, you know, sometimes if a decrypt was saying Private Schmidt is being sent to somewhere else, First reaction is, who's Private Schmidt? What do we know about him? Let's go and have a look at the card index. So eventually, and it had to be done very quickly because time was of the essence in this, intelligence digests were prepared. The really hot stuff, the top, top, top secret stuff, the really crucial things were sent off to a man called R.V. Jones in uh, Whitehall, who was in direct, he was Churchill's intelligence man and passed all of this stuff on to him. In terms of the armed forces and how they got their decrypts and they got out to admirals, generals and so on, one of the advantages that Bletchley Park had right from the start of the war there was an insistence that all of the services would be at Bletchley Park. They could have their own huts but we were not having any of this nonsense like they had in the States about the Army's decrypt, uh, the, sorry, the Navy's decryption effort. It's always the Navy. Had to be totally separate to everybody else's, far better funded, and preferably hundreds of miles away from what the Army was doing. This is not to say that at Bletchley there weren't inter-service rivalries. There were. But in the end, everybody trusted the man in the middle, the man who decided who got to know about what was called the ultra secret. And here we have it in his book. Freddie had served in the army in World War I. He was 42 when World War II started. So as a young man who'd been in the army, he transferred to the Air Force by World War II. Clearly at his age, you're not going to be put up in fighter aeroplanes, but he became basically chief of the air department of the secret intelligence service. And he did a superb job because um, he had to be trusted by the other services to say who was high enough up the chain to be entrusted with knowing that decryption was going on in Bletchley Park and who had to be kept out of the picture. Because always, as you can imagine, the idea was to pass off the intelligence gained as somehow having been acquired from another source and not, of course, from decryption. So Freddy walked around in a bomber jacket and I'm assured by my dad was a complete, um, uh, how should we say, personality and uh, went around and uh, glad handed everybody and clearly did a superb job. And Freddy 
was in charge of what were called special liaison units. These were people posted out to RAF, Army, naval stations to act as a liaison between the Bletchley Park mob and the commanders who really needed this intelligence. So the Bletchley Park linguists, intelligent officers and so on prepared agreed summaries at the end of every day. They were sent out over secure landlines, were these summaries, but there was no way you were going to trust that. They were sent out encrypted over secure landlines. As a result of encountering the Enigma, the Allies, or rather the, the staff at Bletchley Park principally, I think, had come up with their military colleagues with the idea of having a better Enigma, a much better and more secure machine. They came up with a Type X. It was an Enigma, but without the flaws. It was bigger, better, faster, and above all, it would sometimes encrypt a letter to itself, so it avoided the fatal flaw. The summaries were encrypted using Type X and sent out over secure landlines. If you were taken on by Freddy to do this work, it didn't matter if you were only a leading aircraftman Mark II, as my dad was. If you were taken on to do the work, you immediately got promoted to flight sergeant. My dad's proud portrait of himself, taken I think in 1943 in the town in Yorkshire where we lived at the time in Harrogate, and there he is, if you look on the right of the picture, you can see his flight sergeant's stripes. So that pretty well enables me to date it. He was stationed up in the northwest of England at a, near a town called Carlisle, at an RAF base called Annan. Almost you could tell he was the right candidate for this sort of thing because he taught himself shorthand when he was a teenager. He loved the idea of secret writing. And he also taught himself to type, touch typing. Nowadays with computer keyboards, some of us, I've never got round to it, have also taught ourselves touch typing, so it might be commonplace today. But in early 1943, a circular had come round saying all those who would like to be interested in better paid work are invited to come and take an intelligence test, and part of that intelligence test would be a crossword puzzle. So my dad had a go at it. I think it was a telegraph concise crossword, and you weren't given very long to do it, but he must have done well enough because eventually the call came to report to London. And uh, he reported to part of the GC and CS uh, set up, which wasn't in Bletchley Park, it was still in London, had loads of interviews, loads of further tests and so on, and was eventually told that he'd passed the tests and that if he accepted the job offer, he would be instantly promoted to uh, flight sergeant more money, it will be a much more interesting job, and that he will be helping in some small way to win the war. Fine. Uh, in the final stages of the interview, you got to meet Group Captain Freddy himself. It was, went something like this, and my dad said, yes, it did, it went just like this. You get called in, Brailsford, I have to congratulate you, you've passed all our tests, all this, you know. What I'm now about to reveal to you is the biggest secret of the war. If you ever reveal a word of this, this is what will happen to you. Presses a button on his desk. In comes the staff sergeant with a service revolver. Fortunately not loaded, but I don't know if my dad knew that at the time. Pointed us at my dad's head and just went click. He said, yes, we will kill you if you <laughs> reveal this secret. And of course, as Freddie says in the interview, well, reduce them to jelly, you know. Yes, it did. My dad's was always a quiet and rather reserved chap and honestly I, I do believe in some ways it made him slightly more introverted. It wasn't that he wasn't a charming chap and a great dad, he was, but I think like many people related to this work in the war, they were worried all the time that not deliberately but just by accident something they said might give the game away. He really, really worried about it. I can understand that now. So anyway, we went on on this basis of uh, what did you do in the war, Dad? Sorry, son, I can't tell you for many, many years afterwards. And suddenly, all of a sudden, I didn't even know about Freddie Winterbottom. My dad in the early 70s <coughs> phones me up. I was in Nottingham at the time. My dad said, look at this. You remember that I told you how top secret this was? He said, the chap who personally threatened me with instant death 
If I ever revealed a word of this, I was now going to publish a book on it. I can't believe it. The ultra secret. We weren't even supposed to say the word ultra. That's how secret it was, you see. So I thought, heavens. So I said, come on then, Dad, tell me all about it. Um, afterwards, I found out that it wasn't just Freddie being a maverick, although he was. The reason that he got permission to publish this, and he did get permission, was something like the following. The Winston Churchills and the top brass in Whitehall of this world wanted to keep Bletchley's stuff secret, preferably for a hundred years. Their American colleagues who were building all these bombs and enigmas and replicas and joining us, oh, come on, you cannot keep the lid on it for that long. It'll become old hat. No, come on, you know, you guys, you've got like a 25 or a 30 year rule and, and still Whitehall was saying, not nearly long enough, we need far longer. And the Americans say, look, we are far better with this stuff than you are. I don't think they quite had a Freedom of Information Act, but they made it very clear that they were going to tell at least some of the story after 30 years. Around about 1974, all of a sudden, Freddie, who'd wanted to publish a book and been told resolutely no, suddenly gets the go-ahead. I think, I'm cynical about this, that some of the top brass had worked out that Freddie's story about, yes, it's top secret, there's all these boffins doing this wonderful stuff, but I don't know the details, but I will tell you how I recruited my cipher sergeants, absolutely ideal. No technicalities involved, and yet it sent a clear signal across the Atlantic, this is our show, we're going to get in first, you know. Um, so that's why Freddie went on a book tour and cheerfully would um, sign books. So my dad went up after the talk, introduced himself, it was the first time he met Freddie since he was threatened with instant death, I think. And as you can see on the inscription here, Freddie's wonderful handwriting, you know, what does it say? F. Brailsford, one of the silent men, signed F.W. Winterbottom. The trouble is he's writing so bad, my dad has had to write the word silent so that we can decrypt the signature, as it were. As far as my dad was concerned, what then followed was really interesting, glamorous in some ways, but full of cold and muddy tents at the same time. One of his first postings, this was in late 1943, was to Admiral Bert Ramsey's operation at Portsmouth. This later merged in with a much bigger operation because those of you of an older generation out there will know that it was decided in the lead up to D-Day in 1944 that the Supreme Commander would, of course, have to be an American since they were putting in the great majority of men, materiel and so on. Effectively, my dad was attached as a part of a huge encampment of people right next door to Eisenhower's headquarters. And what would happen every day is that he would, at a certain time, connect his Type X machine to the secure landline from Bletchley Park. He would get over the teleprinter landline the summary, suitably encrypted. He would set up his Type X machine. He would then go with the decrypt off to not Eisenhower himself, but a senior intelligence officer who Freddie had agreed was senior enough to be in on the ultra secrets and know all about this. And I think what had to happen, I'm not sure, was that the decrypt in some way, I'm not sure of the details, was then transcribed to a one-time pad, as it was called, you know, a cipher mechanism that's used once only, taken into Eisenhower, deciphered in front of him, you know, strong security at all stages. Eventually, once the message about this crucial thing about, I don't know, timing of D-Day or whatever, was uh, got through, the uh, intelligence officer would come back, shake my dad by the hand, and the two of them had to solemnly burn all of the transcripts and stir the ashes and throw them away and all this. It was almost a ritual, my dad said, that you had to go through to destroy the evidence. And I said, well, what, were there any problems? And he said, well, apart from not being able to sleep in the tents and the constant buzz of airplanes taking off and so on, the biggest problem were people both on the American and the English sides, who were fairly senior but not senior enough, jumping up and down and starting to say, come over here, Brailsford, anything you show to those Americans, you show to me, and having to show them your top secret orders that said that wasn't true, and then watching in great glee as a US England shouting match broke out. The further adventures involved having to follow behind uh, Eisenhower's headquarters uh, set up a little bit, 
uh, in late 1944 across into northern France. Uh, of course, you needed the intelligence operation right behind the leaders. At the same time, Churchill was completely and totally paranoid about not wanting the SLUs and the Type X machinery to get too close to Berlin because what Churchill was worried about, and it's even mentioned in the imitation game quite correctly, Churchill was paranoid, not so much about the Germans, but about the Russians getting hold of this technology. I think my dad was demobilised um, at VE Day, uh, which is mentioned in Freddy's book. Uh, I think he was in the Ardennes in Belgium at the time, and everything went very smoothly till the end of the war. But that's just part of the story and I suppose my my friends and so on say to me well this is amazing you know your dad was one of these cipher sergeants do you think it's got anything to do with you being interested in puzzles and, and sudokus and computer science I have not the slightest doubt it is if you believe in genetics at all I now look back at what my dear dad was interested in and how he really loved to have explained to him everything I was doing more or less as far as he could follow it He's not in any way up in the Alan Turing genius category, not at all, but he was, he had that talent for taking immense pains about things and plodding on forever till he understood it and was very methodical and all that. So yeah, I think it was inevitable, folks. That's probably a large part of the reason why I turned out to be a computer scientist. Mingus, who features in the imitation game, eventually became the person we all know as M, the head of MI6 in James Bond, except that inside MI6 he's not called M, he's called C. So just remember, when you see the imitation game, the person Mingus, who's so helpful to the decryption effort, is actually the prototype head of MI6.